We all have unique lives, whether you invested in crypto for the first time this year, own an up and coming small business, or are raising rambunctious twins like I did. Luckily, TurboTax Live has experts who can answer your tax questions, walk you through the whole process, or do your taxes for you from start to finish, no matter your unique situation. To TurboTax Live experts, an interesting life can mean an even greater refund. Visit TurboTax.com to learn more. You do your thing. They've got your taxes. Into it, TurboTax Live. They're dogs, and they're playing poker! <laughs> Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I am an independent woman. At least that's what our writer Paulette says here, because I buy my own diamonds and I buy my own rings. Okay. Well, today, with a simple 12-step plan to start investing and grow your wealth, we welcome the author of Miss Independent, Nicole Lappin. We got the Haven Lifeline, then we'll have headlines, and my trivia for all the honeys who making money. And now, two guys who are always 50-50 in relationships, it's Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G. Another harmonious day here in the basement. Welcome to Wednesday, everybody. I'm Joe Salci. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And you've made it halfway through your week. So, time to grab the cup of Joe, the cup of coffee I didn't, you know what how can a joe say cup of joe i can't do that remember when you had a blog called that yeah we did. yes cup of cup of og how about a cup of og that would be awesome right across the card table how are you my friend i'm always electric well you know what you know what <laughs> makes it electric <laughs> hey doug you gotta hold it in when he says that you gotta have the it's straight just, face i didn't know he was a stand-up comedian too it's... just say yes you are my friend oh, yes God. you are we got nicole lapp in here she's gonna make it electric every time she comes to the basement she drops some truth bombs like my favorite phrase ever drop some truth bombs whoa on your cup of joe Yes, my cup of Joe. We got all the slang today, but we got Nicole Lappin talking about dispelling a lot of the money myths that are out there, getting rid of some of the jargon, more inclusive financial planning. If you're somebody who's just new to our show, new to this whole world of finance, going to love Nicole. And actually, frankly, even if you're not new to it, it's refreshing to hear Nicole's take. First, we got a wild and crazy headline that uh, happened late last week, but first... We all have unique lives, whether you invested in crypto for the first time this year, own an up-and-coming small business, or are raising rambunctious twins like I did. Luckily, TurboTax Live has experts who can answer your tax questions, walk you through the whole process, or do your taxes for you from start to finish, no matter your unique situation. To TurboTax Live experts, an interesting life can mean an even greater refund. Visit TurboTax.com to learn more. You do your thing. They've got your taxes. Into it, TurboTax Live. Our priorities, they've changed. It's not just about getting ahead or the constant grind. It's about knowing what you want and focusing on what matters. That's the kind of thinking that went into the completely redesigned 2022 Lexus NX. More than an available 14-inch touchscreen, we gave it an all-new intuitive interface designed to minimize distractions and frustrations. More than an impressive safety system, it is the most advanced standard active safety system ever offered in the Lexus, designed to not only help protect you and your passengers, but others on the road. More than offering gas, turbo, and hybrid options, it's also available as a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. More than a well-designed driver-centric cockpit, it's available with a range of features that any driver can appreciate, like a panorama glass roof thematic ambient illumination and a new virtual assistant that can be summoned by simply uttering the phrase hey lexus to see the new nx and to discover everything it was designed to do for you visit lexus.com slash nx the all-new 2022 lexus nx welcome to the next level phev model available in states excluding vermont that have adopted zero emissions vehicle regulations Nicole Lappin upstairs, so let's get our headlines rolling. Hello, darlings. 
And now, it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamin's Headlines. All right, we're going to take it right from the press release. This uh, comes to us from Business Wire, which is, by the way, a Berkshire Hathaway company. President Business. Isn't, isn't everything a Berkshire Hathaway company now? I'm okay if everything's owned by Warren Buffett. He's a good dude. He's good people. Makes, makes the world a better place. Well, does this make the world a better place? This news is out of Zurich. Today, UBS, the big brokerage house, and Wealthfront in, quote, and this is directly peeps from the press release, industry-leading automated wealth management provider serving the next generation of investors, signed an agreement whereby UBS would acquire Wealthfront in an all-cash transaction valued at $1.4 billion. Very nice. Through the acquisition, UBS will accelerate its growth ambitions in the U.S., broaden the firm's reach among affluent investors, and expand its distribution and capabilities. Oh, gee, what's going on here? The big brokerage player, UBS, coming after the uh, the millennial, coming after Gen Z, coming after the wealth front peeps. Yeah, turns out all that technology really doesn't uh, buy independence, does it? I thought this was going to be game changing. I thought that this whole, I thought the whole idea of robo advisors was they were going to stick it to the man. Yes, they were going to take it to the man till the man shows up with bigger pockets. Isn't it interesting? I think Spencer Jacob had it right on Monday. For people that missed Spencer Jacob on Monday, he talked about the GameStop revolution and how Wall Street OG actually likes that. Wall Street's like, hey, guess what? We created a whole new generation of people that think they can beat us. Well, and I think that, you know, the story here is not that Wealthfront was acquired by UBS. I mean, it'll be interesting to see what happens. This happened to United Capital, right? United Capital sold to Goldman Sachs a couple of years ago. United Capital being the big, for people that don't know United Capital, it's the, it was the big uh, financial planning firm. Yeah, it was a pretty good size planning firm. Yeah, a couple, you know, 10, 15 billion or something. The story is now is, is it shows that big companies don't have to do anything. You know, we were talking on Monday about banking and product fees. We had a we had a question from somebody about like how do we get the the you know help people who who can't afford to pay banking fees and all this other sort of nonsense. Like how do we help them? There's no incentive for innovation at the investment level because somebody else is going to do it, and then UBS can just come and buy them. There was another article that I read just the other day about how people just despise Vanguard technology. Like the technology platform for Vanguard is trash and hasn't improved. We see it. Forever. We see it on our platform all the time. People that love Vanguard, everything else about Vanguard can't stand using the website. They talk about how onerous yeah, it is. Or, and- or sitting on hold for three hours to talk to somebody, you know, that's an easy transaction you should be able to do online. Well, they, um, yeah. I mean, they have problems listening to people. They've only got one ear. Talking about Van Gogh, right? No. How long have you been sitting on that one? But waiting on that joke for like a month. I know. I got to use it. Just waiting for one of you to complain about the customer service, and I'm like, yes, there's my opening. I, that didn't that didn't come out when I used my real voice the way it did in my head. <laughs> I thought it was going to. Thought it was going to be way funnier. Oh, it was. Just mm-hmm. not to Captain Grumpy Pants. Continue, OG. Okay, that's enough crickets. But this we wasn't get it. the this wasn't the issue. This wasn't the, the only issue with Wealthfront. I mean, Wealthfront for people that are new to the show and haven't seen this incredible story, the whole story arc. Let's go back to the beginning. Wealthfront, Betterment, the whole robo advisor trend. The first thing that you and I reported on was that the term robo advisor is a horrible moniker because yeah. there's no advising going on. There is digital automated diversification, which is not what an advisor does. An advisor might outsource that to somebody like like Wealthfront, but there's no advising. Then the second thing that we reported on was how these companies that were going to change everything and were going to all lower the fee schedule for the average person had to find ways to make more money. So Wealthfront had to create some funds some internal funds that looked a lot heavy on cash and a little bit higher fees than the ones that they had so that they could actually start bringing in some money because this idea of sticking it to the man wasn't really working. And, and put all of your money into it without telling you. 
correct. Yes. <laughs> Immediately you go into our fund so that we yeah. need, we can make more money. And then now, well, guess what? We, we need an investor exit and, uh, UBS is, it, 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 I don't think it was ever about you. Well, I mean, but you being the investor, is it, is it ever you being the investor in is it ever? Well, it, it needs to be, I, I do think Vanguard, let's go back to Vanguard. I do think Vanguard's about the investor. There's no motivation to make it better. They're rolling in assets. They got a bunch of people that are out there saying, go with Vanguard. I mean, go into any online forum. Everybody says, go there. So the average investor goes to this website that is suboptimal and goes, well, I guess I got to endure it because everybody, there, there's no motivation, OG, for them to change it with Vanguard. Yes, that's but, right. So why? But I do think that, you know, when you look at their low fee approach, I think Vanguard is about the investor, though. I think they look at what they need to change. On the wealth front, front <clears throat> on the front of wealth front, on the, the front, back on the, the wealth, wealth front, front porch, front. back into the front of wealth front. Back, back to, on the front. We'll just call it the front. Yes. Maybe that's what they'll change. Is their this name whole thing to, in the front. front? Is this whole headline in a front? Oh, 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 nice. That was a good one, actually. Verbal ninja. Well, like a green belt. Let's not. Can quite... somebody say something of substance? Possibly. <laughs> All right. Yes. Back on uh, the wealth front. I'm hoping that this will open up a path for the brokers at UBS to be encouraged to work with people who are under the, you know, 250K or 500K limit that they put on on their commission platform. Because all the big brokerage companies, Merrill and Morgan and, and UBS, they didn't, they, it was so ingenious. They didn't say, we're, we're not going to accept clients that have under X dollars. And I think the number is 250,000. It could be different. But last I knew it was 200. They didn't say, we're not going to take you as a client. They said, we're not going to pay the brokers for, for accounts under 250. You can take as many you as you want. You can have all the $100,000 accounts you want. <laughs> you know, you're just not going to make any money doing it. So obviously that, that skews the people that are interested in helping for advice. That skews the, you know, the demographics there. So maybe by this acquisition that will have a path for people to get advice. You know, we talk about how, how a robo advisor isn't an advisor, but there are people at UBS that are, right? There are brokers and financial planners and good people at those companies. So maybe this will kind of transition or at least give a path for those people that don't have a million dollars yet to get good advice, you know, for their financial planning goals. Not just a great asset allocation that's tax loss harvest, whatever the hell the computer says to do it. But know? if Wealthfront really isn't about advice now, how is it going to be about advice now that they're with UBS? Like, how is that going to... You're hoping they start attaching this to something. They take the technology and they attach it to something more. Well, that's what they're going to do. Absolutely. Yeah, that's 100% what they're doing. They're going to fold it into UBS, and this will just be a product offering for UBS to attract clients that have under whatever their limit is for their regular Much more brokerage. like the Goldman Sachs Marcus approach. Well, maybe, but I, I mean, United Capital wasn't the same demographics. Although maybe you're right, because Goldman Sachs, you don't think of as a mass affluent middle America financial planning company, right? Like they're, you've got 25 million, you go to Goldman Sachs, right? Yeah. And so maybe in some respects, that was the same thing. Them kind of niching down a tier. I don't know, like going, well, yeah. we, we'll slum it with all those people with a million. Right. <laughs> you know, and maybe it'll be a similar thing here. I mean, that's the best that you can hope for. Because but, Marcus, Marcus really is, you know, much more mass market. Well, Marcus, is, I mean, that's a whole different thing. Yeah, but it's a part of Goldman Sachs. I'm saying this might work in a similar way. Yeah. Well, United Capital, Marcus, Goldman Sachs, two, three different things. Yeah. But no, agreed. Maybe, yeah. maybe that's the thing. And I think everybody has to recognize that every company is in business to make money for shareholders, especially as you get more and more into using VC money and private equity and stuff like that. Those, those folks want a return on their money. You know what I mean? Like when you see, hey, this company acquired a 27% part of such and such of organization, that PE money isn't sitting there. That VC money isn't sitting there going... Well, we hope that you change the world and let us know if there's a profit down the line. They're like, turn this over because <laughs> I need some cash. Yes. Back. 
What's our exit strategy? You know, exactly. in every meeting they're talking about, what is my exit strategy? How am I, I going to get this, this money back? So I can go somewhere else. That's right. So that's what this is for a lot of people. But there's some good stuff. I mean, out of the couple of them, I think probably if, if I had to pick a winner, I would say Wealthfront's my favorite. But it's far from an advice platform, right? So maybe that's the combo. Maybe that's what will happen because of this. So if I'm an investor, though, listening to this, I mean, we've kind of sliced and diced this, but what's the what's the real takeaway? I mean, is it that commission-based advice, big guys always win, stay away from the big guys? I mean, do we, do we <laughs> I don't know what our takeaway is. I see this headline and I go, okay, Wealthfront. Uh, and I mean, if I'm not in Wealthfront now, what does this do for me? I don't think that it does anything for you. I mean, if you're a Wealthfront client, you know, carry on. You might have, hopefully, some access to other stuff on the back end of this transaction. If you're a UBS client, I don't think this does anything for you either, except for maybe you'll have access to cooler, smoother technology, because that's what they're buying, right? They're not, they're not necessarily buying a, some cool asset allocation model. I mean, UBS already has that. Yeah. <laughs> they don't need that. Yeah, they already, they already have their own. So, so maybe the synergy will be worth something. Interesting to see what happens here if this changes the Wall Street game at all, if it uh, reincorporates what we saw in the 90s, in the early 2000s, the dismantling of small accounts on Wall Street, maybe maybe a step toward bringing that back. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but uh, it'll be interesting to watch. I mean, technology might be able to bring the little guy back to Wall Street platforms. That's the only way that it can. Yeah, because it makes it uh, much more cost effective. Coming up next, Nicole Lappin. If you're not familiar with Nicole, she was a news anchor on CNBC. She was the youngest news anchor, actually, on CNN. She's also been with Bloomberg. She served as a finance correspondent for MSNBC, been on the Today Show. She's also a New York Times bestselling author, and her new book, Miss Independent, is out now. But today, she's got advice not just for women, got advice for all of us. Nicole Lappin coming up next. But uh, to get there... Doug, you've got uh, you've got today's trivia for us. I sure do. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. If there was ever an independent woman, it's Joe's mom. She buys all the rocks she got, though, of course, they're just the cubes she pours her Johnny Walker over. Hey, many of our financial heroes are women. One is Melody Hobson, president and co-CEO of Ariel Investments and the chairwoman of Starbucks Corporation. Some lucky dude named George Lucas got to marry her too. So here's my question. The fund company that she's co-CEO of, Ariel Investments, is based in what city? Do you own or rent your home? Sure you do. And I bet it can be hard work. You know what's easy? Bundling policies with GEICO. GEICO makes it easy to bundle your homeowners or renters insurance along with your auto policy. And it's a good thing too, because you already have so much to do around your home. Go to GEICO.com, get a quote, and see how much you could save. It's GEICO easy. Visit GEICO.com today. That's GEICO.com. Hey, stackers, it's a new month, and you know what that means. If the end of the year celebrations wrecked your January financial picture and you're still trying to dig out, well, maybe now it's time for some help. And Navy Federal Credit Union helps you take control of your finances after the holidays. They offer digital tools and educational resources to help guide your decisions. With Navy Federal, you can automate your savings and investing to put your money to work for you even as you sleep. Plus, you can buy fractional shares. And if you want to pay less interest to the man, you can get a low intro APR on their platinum credit card. It's their lowest rate card and a great tool to pay less interest while you're paying down debt. Navy Federal even has multiple savings and investing options to help you get closer to your financial goals. Learn more at NavyFederal.org. That's NavyFederal.org. Got to say it like a pirate, right? NavyFederal.org. Message and data rates may apply. Savings products insured by NCUA. Investment options are available through Navy Federal Investment Services and are not insured by NCUA. Hey 
Hey there, stackers. I'm Beyonce fanboy and bitter George Lucas rival Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. Melody Hobson has been the co-CEO of Ariel Investments since 2019 and president and director since 2000. She has also been the director of a little outfit called Starbucks Corporation since 2005. So she's no Joe Saul Cihai, but you know, she's kind of a big deal. Where is Ariel Investments based? Chicago. Boy, that's my kind of town. And now to teach us all how to be a little more like Ms. Hobson, let's say hello to Nicole Lappin. Coming back down to the basement, my great friend Nicole Lappin is here. How are you? That sounds so wrong. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> Coming back down to the basement, like where I torture my victims. <laughs> um, no, the... the, the <laughs> <laughs> Can we start over? <laughs> no, we can't start over. That's I think that sounds works. true, but you have been here a few times and you've never been tortured. And as I've told you before, Nicole, it doesn't smell that bad. And mom is always gracious upstairs, as you know. That's I see true. that she yeah. gave you the plate of cookies. So we're ready to talk about Miss Independent. Yeah, I think that you should write Mr. Independent. I think I think I should, but I had I'm busy with a different book at this particular That's true. maybe my only book. I don't know. But I want to start off with a story because I think this makes a lot of your positions clear, which is you met Kate Spade. And can you tell us that story? Because I think that's a great place to start off with all of the lessons in the early chapters of your book. Yeah. Kate Spade was my shiro. I looked up to her. I never forgot when I finally was able to buy a Kate Spade purse. And I'm a big fan, as you know, of celebrating those wins financially because you remember when you're able to treat yourself and it, and it means a lot and you should celebrate them or, and not have shame. So when I met her, I was doing a conference for retail investors. She was there and I worked up the courage to go and say hello to her. And what I realized that I didn't write in the book is that Kate Spade is kind of like the pretty girl at the dance that you think everybody is talking to, but they're not because they think everybody else is talking to them. And so she was so gracious when I came up. She she was so warm and welcoming and cool and kind and a woman's woman. How old were you, by the way, at this point? Gosh, I was like 25 or 26. And I wore shoulder pads and teased my hair. So I looked older, but like I do. uh, Yes, that's right. Yes. I always take your photo to my hairstylist. Um, Teasing both hairs, right? (laughs) All all two of them. Uh, But I was in business news really young. As you know, I was in my teens cannot believe that. And 20s. And, you know, I was going mano a mano with a lot of these CEOs and business leaders. And, you know, I thought that by doing those ridiculous things, they wouldn't realize how young I was and how inexperienced I was. I didn't realize that my youth was actually a big asset. But this is a whole other podcast that I'm digressing from your original question. Uh, When I met her, she was wonderful and gracious. And her, the news of her death hit me I met her once. We were not besties by any stretch of the imagination. I'll never forget that time. But it hit me really hard as it hit many people, including and especially those closest to her. But it made me really put money into perspective vis-a-vis meaning and happiness. And I think that money without meaning is just paper or just numbers in your bank account. When you look at women, people, Anthony Bourdain, for instance, who have died by suicide and they seemingly have it all and are on top of the world, then you realize that money is not what makes you happy. But Money with meaning can be amazing. Now, I'm not here to speculate, of course, on any of the circumstances surrounding that, but it really serves as a great reminder to me that some of the wealthiest people out there are some of the people that are most unhappy in a lot of ways, whether you see it or not. And 
as you know, there's this sweet spot around salary and how much money you make that is this optimal area for happiness. And so I think a lot about what money means and the power that you can wield when you have it and how you can use it because you can use money in a lot of different ways. Like you can use a hammer to build a house or to tear it down. You can use superpowers for good or evil. So it's more about how you end up using the money that you make than anything else, because money is a mind, as you know, you know, whether you have money or whether you don't have money, people are ashamed. They're ashamed that they have a lot of money and they want to hide it. They're ashamed that they don't have a lot of money and want to hide it. And so I think the biggest impediment to a lot of folks getting their financial lives together once and for all are all of those stories we tell ourselves about money. We can't do it. We don't know the math. We don't, yeah, we're not from money, all of these things. Well, you've never been a big fan of cliches. And I really feel like over the past, I don't know, six, seven years, this seventy, eighty thousand dollars dollars whatever it is with inflation now, right? Inflation huge lately. Maybe now it's 500. I don't know what it is, but whatever this, this idea that we get to a certain amount of money and don't get me wrong, there's Maslow's hierarchy of needs and then we're okay. But this idea that having $80,000 a year is somehow going to make me happier. You're saying is a cliche that means nothing. I'm allergic to cliches, like deathly allergic to cliches. I dislike all of them. You know, whether that means Your happiness is totally up to you. I don't need to wake up in your life. Only you need to. And really figuring out what you want to do with the money is much more important because it's easier to reverse engineer to figure out how to get the money to live the life you want because goals have price tags, as you know. The bigger question is, what do you want to do with that? So when people say to me, yeah, I just want a million bucks. I'm sure you've heard this too. Like a million bucks would be my goal. That's amazing. Who? doesn't want a million dollars. Nobody. But what do you want to do with that million dollars? Like maybe you need more than a million dollars. Maybe you need less than a million dollars. I think it's really important to figure out that life first and then get the money to live that. It always drove me crazy when I was a financial planner, Nicole, when people would say, well, I'll get the money first and then I'll decide. I'm like, no, 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 that's not going to not going to do it. Your reverse engineering idea is so much better. But I want to get back to that. Because something else that you say earlier in your book caught my attention once again as a recovering financial planner, haven't been there in a long time. But these phrases that we use in the financial planning game or in the finance game that keep so many people out. I mean, your books are all about inclusion. You're trying to get more people excited about money. And yet we use these we use these words like loads or like overdraft protection. And you say, to quote you, like overdraft protection sounds like they're doing you a favor. Hey, we're protecting you while we charge you 35 bucks to protect you. Totally. Like you think it's doing something good for your finances and it's complicated already. And you're like, yeah, I want to be protected. This sounds like a warm hug. I'm on this game. We got to, we got to get rid of some of these words. Like I think, why do we call it a Roth IRA? Like what is a Roth IRA named after the congressperson in Canada? As you probably know, they call it a tax-free savings. That's because that's what it freaking is. It's a tax-free savings account. Why don't we get rid of, you know, when people talk about the, I talk about the efficient frontier a fair amount because I think it's really actually not that hard to diversify your portfolio in this cool way. But when we start calling it the efficient frontier and we talk about like large cap versus just large companies or mid cap, like I remember how that confused me, Nicole, early when I was young, I'm like, man, they're talking about these large cap mid caps. So when I watch in CNBC, I don't know, what is this stuff? And then I find out somebody goes, oh, that just, just substitute the word company. Oh, why don't we just say company? Because we have this crazy jargon, and I think it's really exclusionary. It's what keeps a lot of us out of the game. And this is why I rewrite financial dictionaries in the back of my books and why I probably have been single for so long because of it. Um, Because it really has always pissed me off. That and index funds and chilling. That's my Friday night. I feel like we're... Kindred spirits there. Yes. So a much better idea, a much better idea. And really uh, kind of taking the gloves off here. You talk about what you just mentioned, which is reverse engineering. Tell me what that's all about. How do we start that? I think it's first figuring out how much money you are going to need and what kind of life you want to live. So when people have FOMO or, you know, comparison on social media of somebody posting a picture of a yacht and they're like, oh, I feel terrible. I, you know, what am I doing with my life? 
a friend told me about this. <laughs> um, I'm speaking for a friend. Just kidding. <laughs> is living on a yacht what's on your list? If it's not, then chill. If you would rather retire chilling in a lounge chair from Target, then why are you so upset about this yacht? And the reason a lot of people are upset is because they don't know what they want, actually. And then they, if they do, they keep changing the goalpost on themselves. And there's nothing wrong with rewriting goals. But first, figure out how much money you're going to need to live in a few different levels. I say rich enough, which is like my brown rice and beans diet, as you know. It's kind of was... like the coming in hot. Yep broke.com back in the day in a bunch of debt it felt fancier than ramen so that's what i ate and so that's the bare bones of what you're gonna need to live on then you have a pretty rich threshold which is you know some of the extras included and then you have a super rich if you want that level breaking down what you have always wanted might not actually be as costly as you think if you really double click on like okay do i want to be in a yacht or a, do I want to have a helicopter? Do you want to have a helicopter? Or do you want to ride in a helicopter a few times a year? In which case, maybe you can rent one or maybe you can do something else that's not costly, but still fulfill that goal. So you break down first what those levels are and then decide what your runway is to achieve that. As you know, the longer runway you have, the more risk you can take. You don't need a lot of money to make a lot of money. You just need more time. So I'm launching this marketing campaign that I'm excited about that says, I am glad I didn't invest earlier, said no one ever. Because <laughs> no one's ever said that ever in the history of the world. But sure, people, you know, in your former life as a financial recovering financial planner, you have heard people say, I wish I didn't put so much money in something that went down, or I wish I put more money in something that went up. Sure. But no one said like, gosh, you know, when I was in my twenties, I'm so happy that I didn't put a thousand bucks in the market. Right. No. Wish I would have saved less. Said no one ever. I think this is a good time for this conversation because we're looking at this stock market the last few weeks going all over the place, right? I think it's a great time for your book to come out. Reverse engineering, I would think, kind of takes away some of this game that we play with ourselves about, is now the time to invest? It seems like when we begin with the end, like market going down makes it an even better time to get going. Totally. Stuff is on sale. I love buying stuff on sale. And we hear all this hoopla around inflation, right? Inflation is super high. I think it's going to level off soon. But inflation historically, as you know, is 3%. And the way that you don't lose money or purchasing power, a robber is not going to come and take your money. But if you're putting your money in a bank account and it's making diddly squat, then you're in essence losing money. So yeah, this is a great landscape to start talking about this and growing wealth. You don't need to look at stock charts all day long. You just need to, in my opinion, look at what Warren Buffett put in his will, which you know. Yeah. Was what? Index funds. Yeah. Just, it, he wrote Vanguard, but see, whatever you want, Vanguard, S&P 500 sure. index funds, Schwab is S&P 500 index funds and chill. And so getting past the jargon is the first step. The only financial problems you can't fix are the ones you don't admit you have. And I think we all have problems. We all have issues. And we're seeing a lot of macroeconomic issues going on, supply chain and inflation and market doom and gloom and all of the rates and whatnot. But the only thing we can actually control is ourselves and our own little micro economy, our own little one. Like that's our own self. You talk that's about it like a thing we can control. You talk about it like a 12 step program. You can't do anything until you admit there is a problem, no matter what that's it right. is. And I know every, every person listening to this, I'm sure we've got something that we know that we need to do better with our money. There's always something like when I was a financial planner, there were certainly people that didn't need to hire me, but there was never a person that came into my office that didn't have one thing that didn't need a little tweaking. Sure. Or, you know, there's always more jargon to learn. Like you and I before last year, I mean, we knew about cryptocurrency sort of, right? But we didn't know about NFTs or I didn't or Dogecoin or right. all this other stuff, you know, so the, the language keeps evolving. And so as soon as you get the baseline and the basic terminology down, it's going to change. It's going to get more weird. Where do we go with crypto? Where do we go with cryptocurrency, Nicole? Is that based on our reverse engineering? 
Uh, you know, so cryptocurrency is is toward the end of Miss Independent because it's in the riskiest assets. I like to say limit your exposure to cryptocurrency to 1% of your net worth. Now, everybody has a net worth, not just rich folks have a net worth. So take your assets, you subtract your reliabilities, and well, bam, you get your net worth. Keep it to that because you can afford to lose 1% of your net worth, but you kind of can't afford, using quotes, to miss out on the upside if 1% becomes 100%. I like that take though. Don't be afraid to stick your toe in the pool. Yeah, I'm not super bullish on all things cryptocurrency, but that's a whole other show. It totally is. No, I think the I think NFTs and what they represent, you know, blockchain wise are fantastic. But the idea buying eight bit art just I don't I don't get it. <laughs> I think that I that's kind of got beanie so babies old, written. All, it's got beanie babies or whatever the Tamagotchi or the pet rock or whatever the thing <laughs> was. Like, tulips. Yeah, think about the tulips. Wow, you are old. I'm so <laughs> old. A, that I am is, That's going way back. Salt and tulips. <laughs> you talk about a few different pieces of conventional wisdom. You already talked about one. I want to be a millionaire. Your answer today was for what? Uh, conventional wisdom piece number two, money brings you power and significance. Is this the Kate Spade lesson? I think so. I think that it brings you what you decide it will bring you. And if it's power, decide what kind of power it is. If it's choice, maybe it's a choice to leave a crappy relationship because you're, I mean, I've heard for too many women that they're in abusive relationships, but they're scared that they're not going to be able to support themselves. Money gives you that freedom and that choice to leave a dead end job or to travel if you want to or to work only if you want to and and these choices are very powerful but like i said with any tool or any superpower they can be used for good or evil there are so many topics in this book where the book is written for women however as a dude <laughs> reading your book there's so much that i got out of it but nicole here at the end i want to talk specifically to women in our audience because you talk about a couple things here, which really made me angry. And, and by the way, it wasn't your Ooh. take. It wasn't your take that made me angry. It's that these still exist. And yeah. maybe it's because the last decade of doing this podcast, I kind of live in this la la land now that things are better than they were and things are really coming along. But based on some of the things you wrote, they're not that much better. And one was you say you hear far too often, far too often that managing money is a guy thing. What's that crap about? <laughs> Yeah, it pisses me off. And look, I love dudes. I'm marrying one. I think it's really important to but have. It, you're marrying everybody. a Joe. Let's let's be I'm clear here. You're Joe. marrying a Joe, Those which are is my favorite kind. The of perfect guys. people to marry. Yes. <laughs> anyway, right. yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I just got distracted because what's hilarious is that my Joe was actually formerly engaged to a Nicole who ultimately <laughs> married a different Joe. This is not a joke. <laughs> Um, and it's the circle I, of life, Nicole. It's yes. matrix of life. I think I ended that by marrying a Cheryl. So I'll apologize. Okay. But my sister's okay. name is Nicole. So there you go. There you go. Yeah. So uh, anyway, we're, we're definitely in a matrix if anyone questioned that. But I think some of those ideas around a guy can figure it out are worrisome. You know, when we used to do events IRL for these things, not that I don't enjoy visiting with you URL, I would hear a lot of moms and I, I hear a lot of young women who went to Ivy League schools. Not that that means anything that they're much smarter, but they spent a lot of time and effort and money on their education and their brains and themselves and then they said you know i just want her to marry a rich guy i was like what Ugh. like what year are we in is this is this a joke it's not a joke you know the reason that i write my books toward women is because you can't be all things to all people or nothing to anyone and i wanted to talk in my books particularly to my former self who by the way you know if you never thought and, and you're listening to this and a woman that the balance of power was not affected by money in relationships or that you never thought a guy was just going to handle it, then you're a better woman than I am because I've thought that in the past. And if I'm really honest with relationships that I'd been in in all aspects of my life, if I had a trust fund magically, which as you know, I, I definitely don't, wasn't born anywhere near the basis, more like in the alleyway by the 
bleachers, trash can, whatever. That, uh, that's also a whole nother podcast. It is. We have so many podcasts. I Maybe know. we just need our own offshoot podcasts. <laughs> Stacking rich bitches. So those dynamics would have been different. And money does change dynamics. And money is different for women. And that's okay. We don't need to be upset about it. Women are living longer. So we need more money. It costs a lot of money to have kids. If you want to have kids, I don't care. You want to have 10 kids or 10 cats, figure it out for yourself. Uh, Why either or? You could have both. You could have both. Yes. You could have both. But nothing is more time, money, and energy intensive and consuming than children and planning for them. You know, when your baby maker starts ticking, this is again, a whole other show is the time when your career is in a stride for women. And so you need to talk about and think about family planning and financial planning together, not siloed. Like one of my publishers said, why are you talking about this family planning stuff in a business book? That's not a thing. I'm like, exactly. It should be a thing. And there are different, you know, considerations for women and that's okay. And it's not about shrinking it and pinking it and trying to like dumb this down, but it is a slightly different conversation. A lot of people listen, not a lot of people. I think some people listening might be going, that sounds great, Nicole, but that's pie in the sky talk. But you point to Sweden, who already has a lot of the financial parity that you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a different society than we have. And you know what? I just had Eve Rodsky, uh, who's a girlfriend of mine, who wrote Fair Play and now Find Your Unicorn Space on my show. She was talking about this idea of taking these systems and processes, which I love so much, and I try to do with finances or personal finances, taking something very overwhelming, breaking down into steps feels less overwhelming, but taking that and applying it to your home life and the invisible work that can be done there and how to create the same systems that we use in business, but for our personal life, because a lot of these topics are very overwhelming, I think, and I know you do too. Money is the last taboo that we have. And in order to start talking about it, somebody has to go first. So I talk about all my salaries in my books. I talk about what I make for my books. I'm just like, I don't care at this point. Like, <laughs> whatever. I'll show you mine if you show me yours. Or don't show me yours. I don't, show yourself yours. <laughs> you I'll show, take it for team. show yourself yours. Not in the basement, Joe. No, 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 no. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, last thing. And this was, this was an eye-opener for me. I had never heard this before. Multimillionaires. How many streams of income do you say they have on average? Stop it. You have heard this before. I, no, I, I seriously had not. This, Pinky by the way, the, the fact that you're, once you said it in the book, I went, oh, yeah, because I get the concept, but I never knew there was this stat yeah. was out there. Seven, seven streams of income. It doesn't have to be like seven jobs. And by the way, you know, your salary is never going to grow wealth, even if it's super high. Your base salary isn't. Saving and budgeting is not going to grow wealth. Investing is going to grow wealth and a lot of different streams of income, which don't necessarily have to be salary based. So dividends and, you know, interest and properties and royalties and all sorts of stuff can amount to streams of income or mailbox money or whatever you want to call it that contribute to most of what makes up the income of millionaires, multimillionaires. I love that. And then you, you talk and people can look at this in the book. You go through your streams of income personally, it's talking about getting naked with your money. I mean, you go through it all and tell everybody all that. The book is Miss Independent out yesterday. Congratulations. Thank you. And thanks, Nicole, for hanging out with us again. This is, this is I feel like you're one of those people that I know very well, but we've talked like four times ever. I know, but we're still best friends. We are BFFs. Right? Absolutely. Right? absolutely. In my mind. I pinky swear. Right. Yeah. <laughs> hey, this is Pete the Planner, USA Today money columnist and host of the Ask Pete the Planner podcast. When I'm not fixing the weirdest financial situations you've ever heard of, I'm stacking Benjamins. Big thanks to Nicole. You know, I got a second what she said there, OG, about the jargon. You and I have been on that train for a long time. Why do we use phrases like large cap? Basis <laughs> points. Why do we? Nicole's take on overdraft protection. Overdraft protection. Hey, we're protecting you, OG. By the way, we're going to charge you 35 bucks yeah. so that we can protect you. So that you're protected. Yep. Overdraft protection, not for you. Protecting the bank, I think. Uh, hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline and we'll tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, Doug, they put what you value first. Uh... 
What I value most. Uh, I find the hacky sack I lost in 1996. Well, what's cool is you got more time to look for it because you're not filling out those stupid applications, those long old school life insurance applications with questions they already knew. It's all online. Process is simple. Prices are affordable. All policies issued by parent company Mass Mutual, more than 160 year old insurer. If you don't have your life insurance in place, now's a great time to make sure that you get that taken care of. Today, we're throwing out the lifeline to Jay. Say hi, Jay. Hey, Joe and OG. Happy New Year. I understand that under the rule of 55, I can leave my current employer and access my 401k money penalty free with only the taxes due on withdrawal, assuming I'm at least 55 years old. Here's my question. If I leave my employer, take some time off and withdraw money from my 401k, are there any stipulations about going back to work? In other words, if I leave my employer at 56 and I decide to rejoin at age 58, are there any penalties on the money that I withdrew at age 56? I'm 55 and I'm thinking about ways to take a mini retirement for one to two years by accessing my current employer's 401k. We have saved a decent amount of money, but I don't want to wait until full retirement to slow travel with my family. I'm tired of trying to fit a relaxing vacation into the limited amount of time that I get now. And I'd like to take a year or two off for slow travel and touring with my wife and kids on our schedule while we're all healthy and active. My plan would be to retire from my current employer at 56, take a year or two off, and then I would plan to return to full-time work until 65, either with my current employer or another company. I work in a field where I feel confident I could get another job with similar pay and benefits as my current position. Let me know if you can shed some light on this aspect of the rule of 55. Thanks, guys. Jay, thanks a ton for that question. And I got to point out two quick things, OG. Number one, a lot of people don't know that you can access your 401k before age 59 and a half under some of the circumstances that Jay's talking about. And that could be crucial for a lot of people thinking about uh, retiring early. This is a great question for your CPA, just to make sure that you get some sign off on this. But I have not seen anything to suggest that you would be retroactively punished for going back to work after age 55. Now, this only works for the money in your 401k from the company in which you stopped working. So if you have money in an old 401k and then you work in a new job, you can't take it out of both, right? Like it's just the job in which you stopped working post age 55 and you can't put it in an IRA. It's got to stay in the 401k in order to qualify for this. So I'm pretty certain that if you decided to go back to work, let's say in June, and you took money out in May, that wouldn't qualify, right? So I think you have to be very particular about the years, but I haven't seen anything to be very specific about that. But I think just in, intuitively, that must make sense that that if you go back to work in the year in which you're taking withdrawal, you're not retired from that job anymore, obviously. There's no IRS regulation, can't change your mind. Do over. I, I reg, IRS regulation, nope, cannot go back. Yeah. No. So I'm certain that you can go back, but I'm also thinking you should be very particular about when that last withdrawal happened. Don't get your first paycheck of your of your job December 19th, <laughs> you know, having been on, on sabbatical for an entire year. Just wait until the first of the year, just to make it easy. Yeah. Second thing I want to point out about Jay's question, OG, is this. I love this idea of not waiting. I mean, a lot of people say, I'm going to have fun later. I'm going to do yeah. the thing later. And, and I know that this isn't, you know, for all of us, we can't do that with our career. But man, if you have the opportunity to take these mini retirements, it's so good. And I, I mean, I'll even point just to Cheryl and I, we thought that being nomads would be the most fun thing ever. So we did it for several months in 2020. And we found out that that wasn't for us. But had we not taken that mini vacation quote, had we not tried it out and play tested it, we would have embarked on this journey at quote retirement that would have been awful. Yeah, you got to figure out what you want to do. So just do it. I mean, if nothing else in the last couple of years, <laughs> you figured out tomorrow's not promised to everybody. So if you've got the ability to let off the gas a little bit, do it. Did we actually answer his question? Was that his question? Just can I? Yeah. Can I do it? it. Yeah. So Jay, we love what you're doing. And a very simple answer. We believe there is no take back rule, but 
Uh, oh, gee, love what you said. Check with your CPA. This show is for entertainment purposes only, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> If you've got a question for it, happy new year to you also, Jay. Thanks for calling and uh, for Jay being brave and asking a question. Gertrude's going to send him a code so he can check out some uh, swag. Our Haven Life Greatest Money Show on Earth shirt is uh, pretty amazing. And Jay's going to get one. You got a question for us, stackybenjamins.com slash voicemail. All right. Just a couple quick things are uh, if you get the 201, our our referral contest coming to a close next week. So make sure you get those uh, referrals in to win either a Tiller subscription, one of five of them to win a Sono speaker, to win one of five of our favorite uh, board games, stackofbenjamins.com slash 201 to sign up. That Those are deep dives, but also those are to get our deep dive newsletters. And... We're taking the show on the road. Stackingbenjamins.com slash stacked gives you everything for our book tour. OG coming to several places. We just found out last week that Doug is coming to even more events than we originally thought he was coming to several, but um, happy to see that Doug is going to be at even more locations. Oh yeah, baby. And maybe <laughs> and if, he's changing if, his mind actively. If you're lucky people. <laughs> Doug may bless us with his presence. The more I listen to you guys, I'm starting to rethink my whole approach. <laughs> and even more. And as we talk to some of these uh, financial podcasters, you're going to meet a lot of different personalities from your area because uh, they're all coming out to hang out with us, which will be fun. Hang out with Doug. If it's not about hanging out with people, if it really is about doing better in 2022 and beyond with your money, OG and his team are taking clients. So head to stackybenjamins.com slash OG for a link to their calendar to help you think bigger about where you're going with your money and your goals. All right. That's going to do it for today. Doug, man, what should we have learned on this episode, dude? Well, Joe, I'll tell everybody what they should have learned today. First, planning on drawing down some funds from your 401k and then going back to work. It's possible, but might get a little complicated. So be sure to consult with a tax professional before you start your sabbatical. Second, everyone should take responsibility for their own financial success. I thought Joe's mom was going to be my meal ticket and look at me now. Yeah. Anyway, but the big lesson. Bragging on that cash that he gave you is a front. If you're going to brag, make sure it's your money you flaunt. I can't believe how I totally nailed all of Paulette's Destiny Child references. It just comes so naturally. Thanks so much to Nicole Lappin. Her new book is called Miss Independent. A simple 12-step plan to start investing and grow your wealth is available anywhere you can spend your dollars. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2022, and is created by Joe Saul Cihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. The show is written by the brilliant Paulette Perhatch, with help from Joe, me, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. After you listen to our show, check out the 201 Deep Dives, written by our website manager and blog editor, Brooke Miller. You'll find the 411 on all things money at the 201. Just go to stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude is our social media coordinator and the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So, say hello when you see us posting online. Here's a weird fact. Both she and Tina Eichenberg are never in the same room at the same time. To join all The Basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at The Stacking Benjamin Show. Not only should you not take advice from these dorks, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor.
I was very excited as we all came down to the basement to start recording and uh, Doug shared that he watched a show that I reviewed back in, I'm going to say maybe 2017, and this is uh, Marcella. Uh, this is what it's all about. Marcella Backland. It's Marcella, but yeah. It's about the Grove Park murders. 2005, two women, one man killed in the home. We never got him. Well, it looks like he's back. I want to come back to work. Why are you asking questions about Peter Cullen? Do you want to know if I'm the Grove Park killer? We've looked into it. We've ruled him out. These last few years, I felt alone. Don't love you anymore. That is Marcella's husband saying, I don't love you anymore. And the show opens up that Marcella is uh, newly divorced or on her way. I think they're separated. Yeah, they're separated. Yep. Yeah. And her husband is telling her, hey, I don't love you anymore. And she's been stay at home mom as her husband is a high powered attorney and is uh, is uh, the breadwinner. She, though, in her past life was a fantastic, apparently like the key investigator on their homicide unit. And I think it's in London. I'm fairly it certain is. it's London. It, it's definitely London. Yeah. yeah. And so she goes back to work and she immediately starts hunting this killer that you heard in that trailer. And uh, you're going to learn this at the end of episode one, which is the big hook in the series, which is that she can't rule out the fact that she might be the killer. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think it's giving too much away because you find it out pretty early on that she has this unexplained medical condition where she blacks out and that's why she's not sure whether or not she might be involved in this or not and they call and it johnny walker syndrome <laughs> joe you too <laughs> may have committed a murder <laughs> i thought i just went on twitter at 1 30 in the morning Tur turns out i cap somebody some of us go drunk shopping online <laughs> You get out your steak knives. I ordered, a, I ordered a bunch of Cutco knives and used them. Night number one. <laughs> yeah, but it's very well acted, especially by, and I can't remember her name right now, but but the actor who plays Marcella, I know it. But she's really believable. And uh, I think colloquially, they might call this a procedural crime drama. And I don't like that term no. because it sounds tedious. It makes it feel like, okay, it we're does. just going through like the motions. Like a paint by numbers. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not at all like that. Or I don't feel that way when I'm watching it. It doesn't feel laborious. It's it's really engaging. I watch this show by myself. Uh, most shows Cheryl and I watch together and she watches a lot more shows than I do. But uh, this is a show that I didn't watch with Cheryl. I've been talking about it for the past three years with her. And I, I like this show enough, Doug, that I would I would watch it again just to watch it with her. Wow. Yeah, I I've I know shows like that and and you know, you might on things like this where there's so many little details where there's investigation of a murder, you could have missed some stuff that you didn't catch the yeah. first time around. This so. is not as good when it comes to, you know, these police who done it and maybe the criminals in front of your face, maybe they're not, you don't know. Not as good for me as Broadchurch was, uh -huh. but definitely, definitely a big fat thumbs up, like huge thumbs up for Marcella. I think you agree then. Oh, totally agree. I haven't uh, seen Broadchurch yet, but it's on my list. And I think the, the Brits seem to have a knack for really producing these great sort of crime dramas that where the characters are very flawed. There's a lot of of backstory with the characters that sort of weave together all the episodes of the crime investigation. You know, they, they link things together really nicely with the backstories of the individuals. They all could be guilty across the pond. You're all maybe guilty. That's right. <laughs> There's a lot of dangerous stuff happening in no Europe. I, it's a good thing we're not allowed to travel there because it's, <laughs> you're going to die. And then you wake up that day and you find out it could have been you just because you flew overseas. And you're in a bathtub full of ice and your kidney's gone. I got to tell you, the bathtub scene, by the way, at the end of episode one is uh, one to watch. Okay. That, that, that sounds kinky. Yeah, I was going to say, it's not. Don't get your hopes up, people. There isn't. I'm in. <laughs> Yeah, I'm it's in. not that type of bathtub OG scene. at the beginning of every episode where it's like M.A., language, nudity, violence, and you key in on the nudity part. It isn't. There isn't that much. You're going to be disappointed. I don't key in on nudity. He keys, keys on explosions. It's definitely the violence. 
Explosions and violence. Ooh, there's violence. 